I mean, you may be seated. There should be some audio with that. Amen. Merry Christmas. Jesus is the reason for the season. I hate to be a name dropper, but Jesus is the greatest name of all. In fact, I really want to talk to you about Jesus today. Does that seem a little bit strange in church? I hope not. <laughs> talk about what's in a name. Was it Shakespeare said, a rose is a rose by any other name? That's true in some instances, but what if we were to say a million dollars is a million dollars in any other name? I would say a million dollars is not a million dollars if I write the check. All right, so, but there are some things that are constants with this particular name of Jesus. And uh, I want to talk about the name of Jesus today as it relates especially to the Christmas holidays and our time as we celebrate this season to remember to obviously keep Jesus at the very center of all that's going on at, during this time. You shall call his name Jesus was the message from the angels. In fact, in Matthew, it's written, or Luke, it's written like this. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, David. What name is that? It's the name above all names. It's the name that causes demons to tremble. Amen. It's the name that makes the difference in any atmosphere, in any condition. A name that's probably been abused as much as been used. But then we understand as believers the power of the name of Jesus. The, the old song used to say there's just something about that name. There is something about that name. Now, I want to look at just kind of historically this name in Scripture in the Old Testament and in the New Testament as well. And then I want to kind of go through the Old Testament and New Testament examples where we see this name and how this name is used. But I really want to relate it all back to this season we celebrate of what that message from the angel was. You'll call his name Jesus. Remember at another announcement said he shall be called Emmanuel. But just what he would be called. Emmanuel means what? God with us. He'll be called, hey, God's with us. But his name is Jesus. In fact, the name of Jesus was a, was a pretty common name, you know, um, amongst the Jews in the time of Christ and in the Old Testament as well. It's, uh, it's made up of two really important words in, in Scripture, one for the most holy name of God, which is Yahweh. The second part of that word is a word meaning Savior or salvation. So when someone was called Jesus, their name literally meant Jehovah is Savior or Jehovah's salvation. Now, I grew up, my name, Joseph, all right? The uh, only one that called me that was my mama when she's upset with me. And it was usually the whole name then. You know what that's like, right? But Joseph is a pretty common name in the era that I was born in. I have lots of friends that were named Joe. In fact, uh, one of my best friend's name was Joe. And growing up, they would call him Joe Joe, so I was not getting confused with Joe. So I always felt, my was just singular Joe. That's probably the greater Joe. But... Uh, <laughs> Joe the Divine never worked very well, though. But there was Joe, and then we had Joseph, and then we had a Joey. And, I mean, there's just lots of Joes. It was a common name. But so was this name Jesus. It was relatively common in the time of Christ. But although it was common, it was given to people a lot by virtue of what it meant, what the name meant. I mean, what a good name for your kid. 
God is salvation, amen? God is, God is Savior. Jesus is Savior. So the title is, is, is awesome, and it's great. There were some Old Testament characters by this same name. You say, well, I remember seeing Jesus in, in the Old Testament. Well, it was the Hebrew pronunciation, whereas in the New Testament, we have a, a Greek pronunciation, and it would be called more likely Yeshua, but even more reference, I will give you about three names from the Old Testament that were really the same name as Jesus. And Joshua is one of those Old Testament characters. In fact, there's a couple of Joshua's in the Old Testament as well, not just Joshua we think of. It took over after Moses departed and led the people into the land of Canaan and the land of promise. But there was also another Joshua's character. Let me give you a couple of those names and what they, what they mean and, and who they are. This first Joshua that I want to talk to you about He's a unique guy. He's the high priest. He's the son of Josedek in the Old Testament, all right? But in the Old Testament, remember, we have all these types and all these symbols and all these shadows that give definition and clarity to the New Testament. A lot of people kind of say, well, I'm a New Testament guy. You know, listen, you need to be a Bible guy, all right? You need, to, you need a good, clear understanding of the Old Testament to really understand fully the New Testament, and so little emphasis today is given on the Old Testament, and I think that's why we got a bunch of spiritual dunces running around who don't really understand the biblical types and symbols and pictures that are given us. But you have this great picture in Joshua, this high priest. He appears in Zechariah chapter 3, and he appears in a vision, all right, of Zechariah. And he's there in Zechariah's vision, and he's standing in the very courtroom of God in this, in this particular vision. Zechariah 3, verses 3 and 4. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and standing before the angel. And he spoke and said to those who were standing before him, saying, Remove the filthy garments from him. And again he said to him, See, I have taken your iniquity away from you and will clothe you with festal robes. So here's the high priest. And of all things in the world, the high priest stands in the courtroom of God and he's clothed in filthy garments. If you're familiar with the Old Testament and the sacrifices and the symbolism and the high priest responsibilities, ultimately the high priest is a picture of Jesus who would be our high priest. And here he is. When you enter the Holy of Holies, you had to be clean, ceremonially clean, clothed in clean linen. It was a holy, holy place. And God being a holy God, in fact, the high priest, when he went into the Holy of Holies, had bells on his garment and a rope tied around his ankle so that if he died in the presence of holy God, in case there was anything in his life that was wrong, you know, he hadn't gotten confessed before God, they could drag him out because you couldn't enter in because you'd die. So here he is, his high priest, and this Joshua, Yeshua, you want to use the New Testament English name, we'd call him Jesus of the Old Testament in this prophecy, in Zechariah's prophecy, he's standing there in the courtroom of God. If you read the whole story, He's under Satan's accusation, and he's clad in these filthy garments, and he's, he's standing there as one who now upon the whole judgment of God is going to fall on because he has all this sin and all this guilt and all this shame that he's wearing. Now, all that guilt and all that sin and all the shame that he's wearing is not his own. It's the nation of Israel's sin. It's their shame. It's their guilt. Remember what Isaiah tells us in Scripture, that all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on Jesus, Yeshua, Joshua, in this instance, prophetically, on him the iniquity of us all. So Jesus, understand, we have this Old Testament picture in Joshua, same name, just different pronunciation because of the language. It's the same name. He's bearing the sins of the people. He's also the high priest. But he's there, one man, to bear the sins for the whole nation. That's a great prophet, prophetic picture. Remember, Zechariah is a prophet. A great prophetic picture of one who would come and bear the sins before God for all humanity. Here we have him stand. It's No wonder John said when he sees him, John the Baptist, says when he saw the Lord coming, he said unto him, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Now, what do we have here in Joshua? It's a picture of Jesus, and he's standing there as a sacrifice for our sins that the sin and the guilt and the punishment of the people has been laid upon him. And what we have here is not a sacrificial lamb, so to say, or a goat. We have here, here is the sacrifice for all the people. He's the sacrificial man. Jesus takes the same place in our life, and he becomes the substitute 
all right, for our sins. So here he is, and the purpose is to show in this prophecy that the, pre- the prophet, who's also the high priest here, he's a sin bearer for all people. As we said, the Lord lays upon him the iniquity of us all. So here's this prophetic picture in Zechariah's vision of this high priest who's also the sacrifice for everyone that's to be born, all right? Hebrews 9 puts it this way. And when Christ appeared as a high priest of good things to come, he entered in through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that's to say not of this creation, and he didn't enter in through the blood of bulls and goats and calves, but through his own blood he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. What happens is that Jesus is in the very presence of God in the New Testament. He's standing there as our high priest, going to confess the sins of the nation, but not just to confess and to sprinkle an offering. He is the offering. I mean, <clears throat> you talk about a Christmas gift. This is God's Christmas gift to you. He's the offering for your sins, this sacrificial offering. He's clad in garments of humility and humanity. He hangs on the cross. He becomes the offering for all our sins. Satan's standing there in Zechariah's vision rebuking him. But I want you to know the judgment of God is settled. Listen to what he says in Hebrews 3.1. Therefore, my holy brethren, that's you and me, whether you like to consider yourself that way or not. You've been made holy by that sacrifice of Jesus. Therefore, my holy brethren and my sister, all right, consider, your, con, uh, uh, partakers of a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and the high priest of our confession. And that's one of the Old Testament characters. We can say his name is Jesus, Joshua. There's another, same name, just a little bit of pronunciation, but it's the same word, it means the same thing, Jehovah's salvation. It's this prophet Hosea. Y'all remember Hosea in the Old Testament? Y'all know where it is in the Bible? Right? There's a book in the Old Testament called Hosea, for those who haven't discovered the Old Testament yet. And Hosea is a prophet. And Hosea is being used by God. But it's the same biblical pronunciation as Joshua was a sacrifice. This Hosea, he's a prophet of God. But he also gives us, through his very life, the picture of Jesus Christ becoming a redeemer. Isaiah, uh, Hosea becomes a redeemer in the, in the book of Hosea. And it's, 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 it's unique because we have what in the Bible are called sign prophets. You know, in other words, everything about their life and their testimony is a sign. It's a message. Hosea's life is a message to us about how Jehovah would, would, would come and mediate on our behalf. Remember in the story of Hosea, how many of you have ever, no, I want to ask. But let me just tell you this as a little bit of forewarning. If you haven't read it yet, Understand Hosea is in heaven, and most likely somewhere in eternity you will cross paths with him. And I'd hate to, what your answer would be when he asked you, hey, did you read my book? <laughs> that you'd be able to say yes, and I thought one of the most interesting parts, Hosea, was when you wrote, <laughs> just cover your bases before you get there at least. He had a wife who was an immoral woman, a prostitute, a harlot, all right? There's other words we could use, but we'll stick with those for now. It's a G-rated audience. So, as she's there, she's living an immoral life, and she leaves him for other men. Ultimately, she ends up on an, on a, on a, in slavery and being sold on an auction block as a slave. Now, most of us think, well, she certainly get what she deserves. Praise God that we didn't respond that way when the grace of God was manifest. Amen. If we'd have got what we deserved, well, we'd all die and be in hell ultimately, if not jail now. Amen. But here she is. On this slave block, being sold, and the the Lord God instructs Hosea to go redeem, which means to pay a price and purchase her back and take her back. Redeem his, his, his bride. And he moves in compassion, and he moves in obedience, and he moves in humility, and he goes and he pays the price for his wife. And literally, the terminology is he redeems her. Certainly, Hosea in the Old Testament is a great picture of our New Testament, Yeshua, Jesus, Hosea, Joshua, whatever term you want to use here, they're all interchangeable. He is a great picture of the Lord Jesus Christ who comes and buys us back out of slavery, the slavery we are in due to sin in our life, and we become a bond slave of Satan until Jesus buys us back and we become his. Now, when people talk about the Old Testament names and they mention Joshua, most of the time they're thinking about, you know, the the predecessor of Moses, that when Moses passes, 
that Joshua is called upon by the Lord to take the people across the Jordan River and lead them into the promised land, the land of Canaan. And he's the general in chief of staff. He's in charge of leading the people in battle to conquer the Canaanites and to take possession of the promised land. Now, to show you how a lot of people are really bad on typology and symbology of Scripture, a lot of preachers and even hymns in our hymn books relate this crossing of the Jordan as going into heaven. You know, they're going on Jordan's stormy banks I stand and cast a wishful eye to Canaan's fair and happy shores where my possessions lie. Well, that's a terrible symbolism. Makes for it a little cute song, but it's bad symbology and it's bad theology. Because if we're going to use a New Testament, you know, it'll bring that into the New Testament, then what Jordan, crossing the Jordan would mean, would mean dying to ourselves and entering into a spirit-filled life. A life where there are battles, a life where we do have to face conflicts, where there are enemies, where there are struggles, and we go into that land and we're following our Yeshua, our Jesus, our Joshua, and he's the commander-in-chief and he's the general in our life. And the only way we experience that land is by the grace of God and through the power of Jesus in our life and through the work of the Holy Spirit in us. So understand that Jordan represents this promised land, not heaven. It represents the promise of a victorious Christian life. And Joshua is leading the people in these battles and against these powers and against these kingdoms, and he leads them to victory there. In our day, right now, in this moment, in this time, I don't know what you're dealing with. I, I have struggles. I have trials. I have temptations. I have difficulty. I face losses, all right? But understand, we can deal with it. And we can not only deal with it, we're not just coping, we're overcoming because we're following our Lord. We're following our commander. Now, if you try to negotiate this promised victory life, this spirit-filled life, this life where Jesus said we're more than overcomers, we're more than conquerors, it's a life of joy, peace, and victory, you won't experience that unless you're following Jesus. Now, I'm just talking about you may be a Christian and still not following, all right? The children of Israel had a little trouble following for 40 years. They kept lapping Mount Sinai, remember? In your life today, if you're not committed to really following Christ Jesus, you're not going to overcome you may gut your way through some things and pull yourself up out of other things and negotiate yourself out of some issue, but you're not going to overcome unless you're following Christ on a daily basis. Unless you're surrendering to Jesus as your Lord and as your commander on a daily basis, you're going to have a hard time. But <clears throat> let me not stop there. The story goes on because this same Jesus, all right, the angel said, remember that? He's coming again. And when he comes, he's coming as General Jesus again. He's coming as the conquering king again. He's coming as victor over all domains of universe and creation. He's coming as the Lord of Lords, the King of glory. Amen? He's coming as our conquering leader and conquering Joe. Listen to what it says about this Jesus and Yeshua in the New Testament sense in the book of Revelation. You know, let me go back to one more click here. Here we go. It might be a little too small, but I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon it was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge, and he doth make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. That's his crucifixion. And in his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And by the way, if you're not familiar with theology, in second coming theology, that's you and I and the angels of God Amen. coming in glory with him. After the period of the tribulation has taken place, after the rapture has taken place, we've been with him, and now we're coming back with him. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, and with it he should smite the nations, and he'll rule them with a rod iron, and he treads the winepress of the fierceness and the almighty, wrath of the almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. So understand, okay, the Christmas story, little baby Jesus, that's marvelous. That's the first page, all right? That's the first page of the story, that God would come. Jehovah's salvation is born at Christmas, and now he comes and he gives us the full story of what, how it's all going to conclude. As you read the scriptures, as you go through the, the gospels, there's a, the major emphasis obviously is upon the humanity of Jesus, you know, and basically deal with the humiliation of Christ. Yes, Matthew and others present him in certain ways, and, you know, but when it really gets down to who he is, 
He's this God-man who's come to the earth and has humbled himself and will be humiliated on the cross for your sin and for my sin, all right? The common name of Jesus, for the most part through the Gospels, is about, well, he's Jesus of Nazareth, or Jesus of Nazareth of Galilee, or that's Jesus, the son of David. They would add those names to clarify his name because, as I said, there were a lot of Jesuses, a lot of Joshuas. But it's this by that name of Jesus, even, that when Saul is on the road to Damascus to persecute Christians, remember, that he's knocked off his high horse, so to say, and he's there in the dust, and the Lord is speaking, and he says, Who is it, Lord? And the Lord says this, It is Jesus whom you persecuted. He identifies himself with this name. Remember, I said a while ago, at the time of his ascension, at this ministry on earth is finished, his personal ministry, as he's physically fulfilled all that God's called him to do, he's gone to the cross, he's died, now he's resurrected 40 days with the disciples after the resurrection. He's there, and he's ascending into heaven. And remember, as you follow the story, there was an angel, you know, that, that was standing nearby, and the angel who was there recognized him as what? He said, this same Jesus will also come again in like manner. And he simply refers to him as, as Jesus. At the death of Stephen, he's standing in the book of Acts before the Sanhedrin, and they're taking him out and they're stoning him for his confession of Jesus Christ as Lord, the blasphemy to their ears. Stephen looks to heaven and it says, and he saw Jesus, our Yeshua, standing at the right hand of authority and of God and receiving him into glory. So we see this emphasis upon Jesus in the Gospels and more of his humiliation. But now we see him in the epistles and in, in, in the scriptures and the letters of, of, the, of the apostle to the church. We see him emphasized in his, his, his deity, his exaltation. He's not just Jesus now. Now he's the Lord of glory. Now, as the angels even announced, he is Emmanuel. But we see it more clearly. Inevitably, as you follow the New Testament, you see his name, Jesus, connected with certain titles that are honoring titles. He's referred to as the Lord Jesus, or he's called Christ, or Christ Jesus, or Jesus the Christ. When you see his name appearing kind of individually by itself, it, it stresses mostly the human part of Jesus because he was total man. But you see him also now throughout scriptures called the Lord Jesus or Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus, or the Lord Jesus Christ. When those are added to the name of Jesus, they're going well beyond just the fact that he's a human, he's truly man, but also very clearly pointing to the fact he's God. He is God in the flesh. He's not only human, he's true man, he's true God. I love it when we sing Christmas songs. You know, the, the Hark the Herald Angels sing song, song that we sing is written by John Wesley many years ago, Charles Wesley, John's brother. And he wrote a hymn concerning Christmas. But in the hymn, he dealt with a, a lot of simple lyrics that describe Jesus as true man and as true God. Listen to one of the verses from Hark the Herald Angels sing. Christ, there's that anointed and holy name, by highest heavens adored, Christ the everlasting Lord. In late in time, behold him come, offspring of the virgin's womb, veiled in flesh the Godhead see. So we see him exalted, the first verse, and now you see him as coming in flesh, hell incarnate deity, pleased as men with men to dwell. Jesus, our Emmanuel, hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. So it gives a great clarification of the deity of Jesus Christ as well as the humanity. When Paul's writing Timothy, he uses this word in almost an assistant way when he says he's talking about Jesus and refers to him as that great God and Savior. It was Peter's declaration. Hey, there's no other name by which a man must be saved than the name of Jesus. So as we talk about Christmas and the birth of a child, it's, it's, it's Jesus. The whole season is Jesus. The reason for the season is Jesus. And if it's not, and it's just another pagan holiday. This is about Christ and understanding who Jesus is, that he is true man, but yet he is also truly God, one and the same, deity veiled in flesh. I remember hearing preachers early on in my Christian life after coming to Christ would say things like this, and maybe you've heard it before. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem, he laid beside his glory. 
He did not lay aside his glory. He veiled it in human flesh. And he became a man. And his, as a man, every day he lived, he lived a life, well, let me put it simple. He lived a life of faith. He just trusted the Father. He lived as a man. He demonstrated in various occasions as the Father gave him permission to do so. He spoke as God. And he did wonders and miracles and acts as God. But he only did those, remember, as you follow the Scripture, I only do those things my Father tells me to do. And I only speak the words my Father tells me to speak. So you see the controlled humanity of, uh, of Jesus Christ, but you also see him manifest the glory of God on many occasions. There are a lot of titles uh, concerning the name of Jesus. And we said one of them is Christ. That word means the anointed one. That God hath anointed Jesus as his Christ, as his Savior, as his Lord. To say he is Christ literally just simply means to say he is the anointed one. Israel heard all throughout the Old Testament about one who would be anointed. And that anointing would, 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 would require an appointing as well as an anointing to a task. And the task was to save humanity. The task was to become the sin offering for all men for all time. Acts 2.36 puts it this way. Let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made the same Jesus, the one they crucified, the same Jesus whom you've crucified, both Lord and Christ. He is the Christ. He's the one who came to fulfill the mission that needed to be fulfilled. If you would ever see God, if you would ever know life, if you would ever see heaven, if you would ever experience grace, it would come by Jesus the Christ. Jesus, the anointed. He is God's anointed. In fact, there's many witnesses in Scripture as you, as you go through the Word of God. There's about eight witnesses very quickly I'll share with you. One is Andrew. What did Andrew say? He was a follower of John the Baptist originally in John 1:14. We found the Christ. Well, if you've been looking like Andrew, here he is. <laughs> we found the Christ. We found the anointed one. And then there's Simon, later named Peter, when he was asked by the Lord Jesus, whom do you say that I am? And what, what was his response? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Hopefully you're like a Peter, amen, that you're, you're making that declaration that he is the Christ. He's the answer. He's the one that men have been looking for for all their lives. Mark speaks of him. Our third witness in the, fir in the first verse of a gospel, he said, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. John's gospel also written with one purpose, to declare that Jesus is Israel's Messiah. And then John makes the, the declaration in, in John 20, he says, And many other signs truly Jesus did in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and the believing that he's the Christ, you might have life through his name. What a great name. What a glorious name. By believing in that name, you can be saved. By believing in that, li that name, your life can be changed. There was Martha, the oldest sister of Mary and Lazarus, who testified in John. She said, hey, I believe you to be the Christ, the Son of God. Then there's Peter on the day of Pentecost. As he's preaching in the day of Pentecost, he declares it very openly in his message. Jesus is the Christ. We just read you the passage that he's the Christ, the Son of the living God. Paul, as he's standing in, in Damascus after his moment of salvation, he's in a synagogue and he's preaching and insisting to all who are attending, Jesus is the Christ. The most reputable witness, the most honorable witness would be this last witness we call to bear testimony. His name is Jesus. <laughs> He's at the well with the woman who's come out to draw water, the immoral woman. In John 4, 25, woman, he said to him, I know Messiah's coming. Well, she's heard it all her life. Who's called Christ. And when that one comes, he will deliver us all, all things to us. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am the Christ. That's a pretty profound statement, is it not? That's a pretty profound declaration. I am the Christ. Matthew 26. But Jesus kept silent at his crucifixion trial. And the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under the oath by the living God. Tell us if you're the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus said to him, it is as you said. Nevertheless, I say to you after you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Not only, he says, am I the Christ, you see me now, you'll see me later. 
It was almost like, you're going to put me to death. That's not going to end this story. This deal ain't done till I say it's done. And you'll see me later. He's the Christ of God. For centuries upon centuries, the Jews had searched and searched and searched. Who is it? Who is it? Well, here he is, and it's the one and only. There's no hope without him. There's no hope of glory without him. Don't let the world convince you. It is all the time seeking to convince as many people as possible that you don't need the Christ, that there's many paths, there's many answers, there's many faiths. And that is such a lie. There's the one and the only Emmanuel whose name is Jesus. He is the Christ, and he's come to save us all. Somebody ought to praise the Lord. Makes for a Merry Christmas, amen? Amen. Another title used of the name attached to the name of Jesus is this title, Lord. Now, I want you to listen carefully because this is probably one of the most important, honorific, honoring titles that leads to his identity as part of the Godhead. It inevitably leads to his identification as that second person of the Godhead and of the Trinity. He's identified as the incarnate God in many ways throughout Scripture. Not only as truly man, but truly God. But this title is unique. This title of Lord is more exalted than, than just proclaiming his deity. It has so much more that, that it encompasses in declaring his equality with God the Father. He is the Lord. And what does that mean? Well, again, as you study the Scriptures and you look at this word in Scripture, you'll find out as you study the New Testament and looking at this title in, in, the, in the Greek language and translating back to English that there were two words, and they're on the screen, the kurios and the despotes. Both of those words are words for Lord, and they're both used in describing Jesus Christ. They're used for Jesus as, as, as well as Jehovah, in, 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 in that the Lord Jehovah in, in Scripture. Now, we know that Caesar and other emperors in time and history consider themselves to be Lord. Caesar desired to be worshipped as Lord. Hitler desired to be Lord. Hail Hitler. You know, this idea of worshiping certain individuals and deities is, is certainly what Satan s- seeks to get all men to do, to have people worship them. Pagan deities referred to as Lord. But there's only one true Lord. And that's the Lord of glory, Jehovah Lord, Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's look at these two words. The first one we'll look at is that really the second word, which is the word despotes. Or we would say the word despot. What, happened, what, what comes into your mind when you use that term? Well, he's a despot. It means that somebody who's absolute power, somebody who's absolute authority. It's not always used in the, in the best of senses, all right? But it's a word which prescri- describes somebody with unrestricted power, all right, without any limitations. It's also used many times to describe a person who would own slaves. And owning that slave in the historical time frame and within that, 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 that realm of the way it worked, you, you exercise the right over those individuals, the, the disposal of their bodies, their abilities, their energies. You were in charge of their lives, all right? You, you, you were Lord over them. You were the owner over them. You were the master of slaves. Now, a lot of people don't like to think of God in that context, but you understand God's a righteous God. But ultimately, as a righteous God, he's still God. And being God, he's Lord. I mean, the earth is the Lord's. (laughs) It's not yours. The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. Well, I found the oil. It's still God's. I found the golden. It's still God. Well, I found some diamonds. They're still God's. He's the Lord. He may let you have some stuff. Hallelujah when you get it. But he's, he's the Lord. Amen. Let me put it this way. He's the Lord over you. Yes. He's the Lord over me. Yes. Now, Paul brings this out very clearly in talking about this idea of his lordship and slavery over lives and over individuals. In Romans 6, verses 16 through 20, those four or five verses are, are all about slavery. It starts out with that first verse when he says, Do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one slave whom you obey, whether it's sin leads to death or obedience that leads to righteousness. What he's saying is, we're all slaves. We're either going to be a slave to sin or we're going to be a slave of righteousness. Whose slave are you going to be? Well, here's the choice about your slavery. Who are you going to let be your Lord? Who are you going to serve? That's what he's saying. Pretty simple. Who are you going to serve? Now, verse 17 says, it goes on to say, but God be thanked, you were slaves of sin. This is where redemption comes in. He buys you off that slavery block, and he goes on to say, but you've obeyed from your heart 
that teaching, that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. You've been set free from sin. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But catch the next part. But but you're still slaves. (laughs) Now you're a slave of righteousness. No longer slaves to sin. You're a slave of righteousness. Verse 19, I'm I'm speaking to you in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. You may may not clearly understand the depth of what he's saying because we're just mortal. But as you presented your members as a slave to sin and uncleanliness and in lawlessness, that just led you to more lawlessness. But now, realize you're a different slave. You're a slave of Jesus. Present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. The whole essence of that whole chapter 16 is you don't have to serve the devil anymore. You don't have to be enchained and and enslaved to sin and death and the grave. All right? You don't have to let Satan run your life anymore. You've been, you have a new Lord and a, a new master. Now, as Christians, we are servants of God, slaves of God. In fact, as we said earlier, we've been bought with a price, the precious blood of Jesus Christ. That's the price that was paid. Acts 20 puts it this way. Take heed, therefore, to yourselves. What's he saying? Pay attention to yourself, folks. He said, not only to yourself, pay attention to the whole flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. Feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. We have been purchased. We've been bought out of slavery. We don't have to do what the devil tells us. We don't have to yield to our sin. We don't have to yield to ungodliness. We have been set free from those things. Now we can yield to Christ and have a new life because he's Lord. He's Lord over the little L, Lord devil. He's God over the little G, God, devil. He's Lord over all things. And his power to emancipate us and to set us free is within his name and within his precious blood, and he sets us free. He's our Lord. Hey, listen, don't be afraid of that. That's a, I'll, I'll, put it, I'll, I'll explain just a little bit further with this other term, analogy, curios, because he's both that Lord, he's despot, and he's curios. But the second word here, this curios Lord, will give you an idea that when you understand that word, that this is a happy slavery. <laughs> this is a marvelous thing that we've been set free now that we can do what we were born to do, and that's worship God and be what God's called us to be and not be bound by this world anymore. This word curios, all right, it's called, Jesus is called curios 150 times. Another, Lord Jesus is used that way another hundred times. Two words, what's the differentiation between the death spot and the curios? Well, let me put it away, the theologian Dwayne Spencer put it this way. He said, the word despotus and curios is distinguished by saying a man was a despot, Lord, in regard to his slaves. And then he was curios, Lord, in regard to his wife or his children or his family. Now, see what it means. This word curios is used when Sarah is making reference to Abraham. And it says in 1 Peter, remember in 1 6, where she refers to Abraham and she calls him what? Lord. She calls him Lord. She gladly called him Lord. Because that word curios, it, there's this implication of limitations, even perhaps some moral, even self-imposed limitations. Limitations, nevertheless. But the idea is that although he is this despot Lord, God is, he's still also this Lord with great interest, as Abraham would have been for his family, as any man would want to provide, protect, guard, secure, help, and grow their families. He's Lord in that way. It's not cruel bondage, in other words. Our Lord is also a Lord of Kyrios Lord. He's concerned with my well-being. He's concerned with my life. He cares about me as Lord. It's, it's, it's a terminology in the Kyrios state that just means that the, the authority that he does have, this power is God and Lord over all things. He is going to use it for my best interest and for his glory. That's why we can say, you know, if God be for us, who can be against us? Why? He's God. He's despot. He's Lord over all things. And nobody can whoop him. All right? Nobody can overcome him. He's the Lord of glory. But he's also my Lord, Curios. He's concerned about me. He loves me. He's the one who makes sure, imposes, guarantees, and covenants this fact that all things that happen in my life work out for good because I love him 
and I'm called by him. So you understand the difference in those terminologies and the depth of which they are? And we celebrate both of them because I'm happy that he's my curios, but I'm great that he's my despot because that means he can fulfill what he's promised to do. <laughs> that he's the king's sovereign glory over all things. The idea is, it's just that curios is the authority he exercises will always be in consideration of the good over those whom he welds that authority over. He's Lord. We gladly rejoice in that. One of the great historical examples of this, of the, of the willingness of Christians to, to, to embrace that, that idea, that he's my Lord, nobody else, is found in the life of, of the martyrdom of Polycarp. If you're familiar with first century church history, Polycarp was one of the early church fathers in the first century church. He was a disciple of John the Beloved. He was the bishop over Smyrna and Asia Minor. Ultimately, the, the Romans capture him. And they're demanding that he invoke Caesar as Lord and reject Jesus as Lord. And here, here's his words when they tell him to worship Caesar as Lord or die. He gives this immortal answer. He's in his age of years, all right. For 86 years. I have served my Christ, my Lord, and he has never done me wrong. We all have that testimony. He's never done us wrong. You may think he has, but he hasn't. You just don't see the big picture. He's never done me wrong. He went on to say, how can I blaspheme my king who saved me? Light your fires. I fear not the fire which burns for a season and after a while is quenched. Come. Come. Do you will? Why do you delay? Not afraid because he know that even the flames couldn't destroy him because of his Lord. Remember Thomas who doubted the resurrection of Jesus and he's there in that, uh, that room and the doors are locked and Jesus comes the second time to meet with the disciples and this time Thomas is in the room and he's not sitting back to, well, I, well, I assume I believe him. This time Jesus comes in the room and he greets Jesus. And the way it's written, it's almost like with a great cry. He says, my Lord, my God. There's a declaration of despot and curious even in that same statement that he makes. And all the witnesses of scripture, as well as many of the witnesses in this room right now, confess to the glory of God the Father that Jesus is Lord. I love Philippians, quoted often. It's well to be remembered if you haven't memorized this passage because you can use it in the midst of your trials, in the midst of your conflicts, and right in the dead center of temptation when it knocks on your door. Philippians, Paul is writing to the church, and he says, God has highly exalted Jesus, him, and given Jesus a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's the name we bear. When we say we're Christians, it means followers of Christ. If we're going to bear this name of Jesus as our Christ and as our Lord, then certainly, along with bearing that name, we should bear him the honor that is due that name. We should live our lives in a way that honor Christ as Lord, that celebrate his kingship over our lives, and that he is our God. In other words, if we confess Jesus Christ as our Lord, we should live in a way that is honorable and that is blameless, a life that ultimately when people see us, it gives him glory. It honors him. We should walk in such a way that we are unashamed to bear his name. We should live without fear because we know the only one we ought to fear is God who has the power of life and death in his hands. And so we respect and we honor God and we're not afraid of what someone might say or what peers might do or what the world might declare. This isn't a popular thing as it used to be in America when you could say, I'm a Christian. I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Lord, the Son of God. To make that declaration today is to be laughed at, frowned upon, and scorned. So many Christians have refused to stand out and to stand up and to shine as the light God told them to shine. Just the opposite ought to be true when we realize this message of Christmas, that he is Emmanuel, God with us, that he is Jesus, the Christ, and the Lord. How incredible, 
How unbelievable, yet believable, that Jesus came, Son of God, veiled himself in flesh, born in a lowly stable, in a dumpy little barn, so to say, king of glory, humbles himself, clothes himself with our flesh, lives the way he lives, submits himself as a sacrifice for our sins. It ought to blow our minds when we realize this is the king of glory. This is God with us, that he did this for us. How incredible that he died for you. How marvelous that he died for me. How in, I mean, there's no words to describe. Paul put it this way. Thanks be to God for his unspeakable gift. Yes. It's unspeakable. How can you, you could say it all day long, the things that God has done, but still, you still just can't nail it. <laughs> what a gift. Amen. What a savior. What a loving father. Yes. And this gift yes. is yours. Amen. Open the gift. Enjoy the gift. And then it's a gift you can keep re-gifting <laughs> to others as well. Amen. What an opportunity. Everybody's got their mind on Christmas for some reason. Don't they? Yeah. It worked. Yeah. Yeah. Don't be ashamed to say Merry Christmas. Christmas. Yeah. Don't be ashamed to do that. Don't be ashamed to, hey, what an opportunity this week. All week long. Every day people are talking about Christmas, what you do, what you did, what you did, shopping, all those things. You're going to complain, they're going to whine, they're going to cry, they're going to laugh, they're going to sing, they're going to... Everywhere you go this week, you have to say, hey, Christmas. Hey, why don't you come to church with me Sunday? Christmas Eve. We're having a Christmas Eve service, 1045. You don't want to miss it. It's going to be incredible. There's going to be Christmas songs. There's going to be celebration. We're going to put on our festal robes. You don't have to use that if you don't like them. <laughs> and we're going, to, we're going to have a celebration that the God of glory came in form of a human baby and gave himself as a sacrifice for our sins. This place ought to be full if we just do that. It'll be packed out. We'll, we got plenty of chairs we can bring out, okay? We can bring out lots of chairs. I think one thing that will help you to remember to do that is remember what he's done. So that when you say the name Jesus, Yeshua, Joshua, Hosea, they're all just Jesus, that you remember this, this high priest who gave himself and became our sin, that you remember this great prophet. He was prophet, he's priest, he's king, and he redeems us like Hosea did his bride. That you remember like Joshua, who led the children of Israel into triumphant victories into the land of promise, that our Jesus is also our general, and he guides us and he leads us in our victories we're going to face. Even today we'll have difficulties, but he'll walk us through it. How do we get through it? We call upon the name above all names. We sing the name that's above all names. We remember the name. We reference the name. When the devil comes knocking, we, let, we, let, we open the door with a reference that Jesus is Lord. <laughs> and everything goes to him. The Bible says all things are of him, through him, and to him. What a marvelous Savior. Do you know him? Have you received him? And if you have received him, where are you in your relationship with him? Do you realize all that stuff you're blaming God for somehow been allowed for your benefit, for your betterment, yes. for your advancement, yes. for your maturity, for your strengthening, so you can be all God calls you to be, and you can experience the grace of God on every level in your life. Amen. What a mighty God we serve. Let's stand with our heads bowed, and let's put our hearts and our minds upon Jesus.